Oh, and we're live. Great. The computer recording started. Could we start the cloud, please? Backup is rolling. Great. Sergeant Hope, could you give us the opening, please? Oh, thank you. Good morning, and welcome to today's uh, remote council hearing on the Committee on Hospitals. At this time, with all council member staff and council members, please turn on your videos. I repeat, at this time, all council member and council member staff, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals, and I want to start by thanking everyone present today and all of the staff who allowed this meeting to happen procedurally. So I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by some of my colleagues. I saw Council Member Moya, Council Member Maisel, Council Member Levine, Council Member Manchaka, and I'm sure we will be joined by other council members throughout the hearing. So good morning again, everyone. I am council member Carlina Rivera, chair of the committee on hospitals. And I wanna start by thanking everyone present today. Ensuring access to equitable care is a topic I care deeply about. And that necessarily includes ensuring language access and cultural humility and competency within our New York City hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Many of us have stories and even more of us now have stories because of COVID-19. Stories of loved ones being deprived of care because they cannot adequately express their concerns in their preferred language. Stories of being expected to be our family's interpreters or stories of individuals faced with a medical community that has a general lack of understanding of stigma and nuance within our cultures and identities. So I wanna share a personal story with this struggle that clearly shows how the city's failures to fund community organizations, conduct door-to-door -door outreach, and offer reasonable accommodations at hospitals as well as testing and vaccine sites are directly affecting New Yorkers during this pandemic. My uncle, a disabled elderly man with underlying chronic conditions who lives alone in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, has been struggling to secure a vaccine. He speaks and sings beautifully in Spanish only. And being blind, he unfortunately never had the resources to learn Braille. His dedicated home attendant of many years has COVID, but at 82, he cannot wait any longer to schedule his appointment. What he managed to do was memorize the vaccine hotline number and call over and over and over again until he got an appointment for March 10th at Woodhall Hospital. Thankfully, yes, he now has an appointment, but his home health aide may not be available to take him. Now my family can help him, but the city should not be relying on friends and families and communities to assist our hard to reach New Yorkers. And obviously, this isn't just a vaccine related issue. We're here today to examine how all care in hospitals is made worse without effective language access and cultural humility. New York City is unlike any other with incredible diversity. New Yorkers speak over 200 languages. In addition, about a quarter of New Yorkers identify as a limited English proficient or LEP. And about half of all immigrant New Yorkers identify as LEP. We know that the inability to communicate proficiently in English can pose incredible barriers for LEP individuals when it comes to accessing healthcare. For example, we know that patients who identify as LEP experience adverse health outcomes at markedly higher rates than English speakers. They experience high rates of medical errors have worse clinical outcomes and receive lower quality of care 
by other metrics than their English speaking counterparts. Also language barriers are associated with prolonged hospital stays, medication errors and other disasters that are costly for patients. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has only magnified the gaps faced by those who are LEP and multiply the logistical barriers for medical interpretation. Especially at the height of the pandemic, healthcare workers have stated that amidst the overburdened, chaotic and crowded hospitals in the city, patients likely would have received better care if they spoke English. Interpretation is all remote and with medical staff masked, their voices muffled and COVID cases often evolving at rapid rates, there are numerous obstacles to effective interpretation. Patients who are LEP are also unable to have family members help with translation and serve as advocates because many hospitals have prohibited visitors due to the pandemic. All of these circumstances have likely only worsened health outcomes for individuals who are LEP. And this is unacceptable. All patients have a right, a legal right, to interpretation in healthcare facilities, and we have to ensure that they are given access to equitable care. In addition, we have to ensure that care is culturally humble and competent and tailored to meet the social, cultural, and linguistic needs of patients. Health inequities are pervasive in the American healthcare system and also similarly exist in New York City. For example, Black and Hispanic New Yorkers have disparate health outcomes in cancer-related death, early diagnosis, and treatment. And Black, Latino, and Asian Pacific Islander populations have higher rates of diabetes than white populations. We also see disparate health outcomes in maternal mortality and morbidity for Black women. These inequitable health outcomes can also be seen in COVID-19 health outcomes. And those who are older, lower income, Black and Latino are more likely to be hospitalized or die from COVID-19. This pandemic has highlighted so many inequities in our society. And one of the most obvious and glaring is inequities in healthcare. We as a city and as a country must learn from this pandemic and prioritize language access and equitable healthcare across racial and socioeconomic lines. And I look forward to hearing from h, &H and others today about these efforts. I would like to thank the hospital committee staff, Council Harbani Ahuja, policy analyst Emily Balkin, finance analyst John Chang, and data analyst Rachel Alexandrov. I'm going to turn it over to our committee counsel, Harbani Ahuja, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. My name is Herbani Huja, and I'm counsel to the Committees on Hospitals for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We have ASL and Spanish language interpretation at today's hearings, so I request that all panelists testifying please speak slowly so that our interpreters are able to provide interpretation. At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use a Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hands. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Matilda Rahman, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the New York City H&H. &H. Additionally, the following representative will be available for answering questions. Margarita Larios, Associate Director of Health Equity and Language Access for New York City H&H. &H. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Matilda Roman and Margarita Larios, I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Matilda Roman. I'm sorry, I think you are muted. I do. Thank, Thank you. you. Margarita Larios. I do. Thank you. Um, until the remind, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Rivera and members of the Committee on Hospitals. I am Matilde Roman, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals. I am joined by Margarita Larios, Associate Director of Health Equity and Language Access at Health and Hospitals. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you to discuss access to language services and equitable care in New York City hospitals during COVID-19. Health and hospitals is the safety net for the uninsured and underserved in New York City, providing healthcare services to over 1 million New Yorkers each year. Our mission is to extend to all New Yorkers comprehensive and equitable health services of the highest quality in an atmosphere of humane care, dignity, and respect, regardless of their language spoken, immigration status, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or ability to pay. As such, it is a critical part of our mission to provide accessible, culturally, and linguistically appropriate services to ensure full access to comprehensive and quality care for all New Yorkers. At Health and Hospitals, patients who receive care belong to many different racial and cultural backgrounds. An estimated 30% of patients served are limited English proficient. And more than 60% of patients self-identify as either Black, African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, or Asian. That is why Health and Hospitals receive, uh, provides free language services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year in over 200 languages and dialects. We translate patient documents such as consent forms and patient education materials in the top languages requested by limited English proficient New Yorkers. Health and Hospitals is a leader in providing culturally competent and linguistically appropriate services. In fiscal year 2020, health and hospitals facilities received more than 1 million requests for interpretation services that yielded 13 million interpretation minutes. System-wide initiatives to support communication for persons who are limited English proficient include making available language access resources to inform the public of the availability of free language services and tools to ensure quicker access like language ID desktop displays and I speak cards to support facilities in their delivery of language assistance services. Creation of a centralized database system to collect language service usage and key performance metrics to monitor for quality assurance and effectiveness and having a designated language access coordinator at each facility who is responsible for overseeing the provision of language services. Our provision of culturally competent, equitable health services are guided by an understanding of the important role of one's culture, race, gender, and other social identity-based categories in interpersonal and professional encounters in healthcare an awareness of historical and sociopolitical factors such as racism, ableism, immigration patterns, 
and human rights violations and their impact on the health and well being of minority populations. And the value in collaborating with ethnic and racial minority community based organizations to ensure appropriate response responses to individual health needs. As mentioned, language services is a key component to eliminate barriers to care, improve patient safety and enhance the patient care experience. As part of our ongoing efforts, Health and Hospital promotes patient rights to language services by ensuring signage regarding the availability of free language services are posted in public areas. We distribute I speak cards to patients and make available multilingual educational and, mar and, mar and marketing materials. When COVID-19 arrived in New York last March, hospitals everywhere had to quickly adjust their service delivery approach, including health and hospitals. The pandemic ushered in a rapid expansion of telehealth and technological innovations at health and hospitals. With the shutdown order in place and in-person ambulatory services significantly reduced, health and hospital clinicians turned to telephonic and video communication to serve the over half a million patients who rely on health and hospitals for outpatient care annually. One of the most emotionally devastating aspects of COVID-19 was the state mandated no visitor policy. While necessary to curb the risk of spreading the virus, the state's no visitors policy in hospitals and nursing homes nationwide were heart-wrenching for patients, residents, families, and staff. From April to May 2020, health and hospital deployed 1,000 donated tablets across the system through a patient family connection program. Over 500 video calls were made a day to keep patients and their loved ones connected and keep families abreast of their patient status and care. The system-wide language interpretation services supported our virtual communication with families in 183 languages. For patients who do not require admission to the hospital, the system launched an at-home COVID-19 text message-based symptom monitoring program in the city's top 13 languages for patients discharged from the emergency department. Enrolled patients get secured text messages every 12 to 24 hours to assess their symptoms in their language. True to our mission, health and hospitals put its patients first, connecting them to language services while providing safe and quality health care services. Health and hospitals will continue to provide health services in a culturally responsive manner to meet the needs of the city's diverse population. Thank you for your attention to this important topic. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to Chair Rivera for questions. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Rivera, please begin. Thank you so much for your testimony and, and I really appreciate uh, you mentioning how difficult it was to pivot during the pandemic into providing as much care as quickly as possible. So I just wanna thank you all for all of the work that you do and for all of the New Yorkers that you serve without question, openly um, and with the best quality care possible. I want to just ask some questions about some numbers that you mentioned, um, especially during a hearing we had actually in fall 2019. So patients who are limited English proficient experience adverse health outcomes at markedly higher rates than English speakers. During a fall 2019 hospitals hearing, h, &H testified that in fiscal year 2018, it fielded more than 1 million requests for interpretation services. And I think you went on to mention that was 13 million minutes of interpretation. What is the latest figure? So uh, it, they say consistent um, in between March and uh, January of 2021, 
um, we have yielded um, more than a million requests for interpretation services um, in over 13 million interpretation minutes. And, and thank you, Council Member Rivera. I, I want to, Juan, thank you for sharing your story um, and for your continued support and advocacy on behalf of immigrant New Yorkers. Um, you are one of our staunchest supporters and I just wanna acknowledge um, all of your support. So do those numbers remain consistent? One million requests that translated into the 13 million minutes. Has it increased during, have requests for interpretation services increased during the pandemic? Um, ever so slightly. It's been cons consistent um, simply because of the patient population in which we serve. Um, many of those individuals, as you know, are um, individuals who are vulnerable in the city. We are the safety net for uh, the city in providing quality healthcare services. Um, and we um, know that language services is a critical component to ensure patient safety and quality, um, but also uh, to tailor needs um, and ensure that our patients are receiving services in their language. So you said only very little during the pandemic. Can you describe how the pandemic has affected the hospital's ability to provide interpretation and translation? Clearly, there must have been multiple challenges. I think the challenges were more in us being, I mean, the challenges for us have been more in making sure that in our telehealth platform and our ability to create video conferencing bridges between family members um, and patients. Um, and I think for us, um, it really allowed us to be very innovative um, in elevating our technology to really ensure that we were connecting patients to families in ways that were meaningful. Um, as far as volume is concerned, our volume is, other than the slight tech, has been consistent. And we um, have been monitoring the language services uh, very rigorously to ensure that it maintains and we maintain the same standard of quality language services across the system, especially during the pandemic, because we understood how important it was to that patients communicated with their providers and to their families. So you said it allowed health and hospitals to be innovative and you went on to say elevating technologies. What, what has changed in terms of the technology that you're using? So I think it was just more um, augmenting the equipment that we currently use. Um, and so we had a thousand donated tablets that we were able to really use um, in order to have more equipment available for bridging um, interpretation services. Um, so that was actually beneficial um, in being able to help uh, provide more resources for sites. Um, and you know, the services that we provide are multiple. We provide telephonic um, interpretation services. Uh, we provide video remote uh, interpretation services. Um, and during the COVID period, um, those were the two main vehicles that we relied on to ensure that we were bridging the communication divide with our limited English proficient population. Do you still use Linguistica International? Linguistica International is an active vendor within our system currently, yes. So the New York Daily News report, New York Daily News, they published the report in January. They published in January, alleging that overseas workers at Linguistica International affirmed that does contract with the city to provide interpretation services at H&H &H and the DOE, that they were being paid as little as $4 per hour, that workers were receiving inadequate training, and that sensitive personal and medical information shared during calls was not being properly protected. And I know the city has described these allegations as being reprehensible, according to the Daily News. So what concrete steps has the city taken to address these allegations other than referring the matter to the Department of Investigation? Thank you, Council Member um, Rivera, for that question. Um, in response to the article, um, New York City Health and Hospitals began an internal inquiry into the allegations made. Um, this inquiry is ongoing. Uh, but 
I want to one emphasize um, and provide, you know, share with you that we do very rigorous monitoring of language services. Um, we to, just to ensure compliance of our vendor services. We do routine uh, monthly data as we see monthly, which we analyze for usage and ensuring that we, they are meeting our key performance metrics. Uh, we meet regularly uh, with our vendors um, to ensure that we are connecting and making sure that they are meeting their performance and standards that we require of them to provide the highest quality care to our limited English proficient population um, and have our language access coordinators um, on the front line with the day-to-day -day operations at sites. Uh, we also have feedback mechanisms in place um, so that you know you understand how rigorous we are in our ability to monitor the quality of services. Um, and so we routinely monitor for compliance with our vendor services and to date have found no basis to the allegations made with regard to the New York uh, Daily News article. How long does a patient typically have to wait for language access services? Uh, we uh, health and hospitals um, are ensuring that we provide timely and effective uh, services to our limited English proficient population. Um, and we use a variety of different methods to ensure that that happens, whether it's telephone, video conferencing, or even our on-site interpretation services. Um, our effort is to connect patients to language so that they can communicate with their care provider as quickly as possible. So you don't know how long a patient typically waits? Our average, it's on demand. Our average, our average connect time is 20 seconds or less. On average. Has the pandemic, has the pandemic increased those wait times? No, our systems have been stable. Uh, we have actually ramped up compliance and our monitoring measures during COVID-19 to really ensure that we maintain standard quality services throughout the pandemic. So in response to the pandemic, you ramped up the interpretation services in order to eliminate any delays in access? No, I think we ramped up monitoring um, significantly um, just to ensure that there was a, con a, continu a continuous provision of language services. Um, you know, our volume is mass, massive. Um, you know, we provide millions upon millions of minutes of interpretation annually. Uh, the vast majority of our patient population are limited English proficient. We know that this is a business imperative to have language services and make sure that it functions in a way to help both the provider and the patient communicate. Um, and so for us, the ramping up really was related to making sure that we were closely monitoring compliance and ensuring that we maintain the standard of language services throughout the pandemic as we've done pre-pandemic. So I just wanna make sure I heard correctly. You said that a, a patient does not wait longer than 20 seconds for an interpreter. Do you, is that correct? For for um, it, for telephonic and video remote interpreting, our performance metrics is twenty seconds or less. That's our average wait time. I I understand what you mean, but I, I feel like the person walking in asking for an interpreter, seeing someone sitting down picking up picking sitting down and picking up the phone and being connected probably does take about twenty seconds ideally. But overall, when a person enters uh, one of your facilities, I mean, how quickly are they addressed? What, what happens if, if a person can't wait? I, I mean, 20 seconds is, is such a short time span. It's, it's very impressive. But these are not the stories that we've heard from the patients at numerous hospitals across the city. And I'm sure one of my uh, colleagues will speak to this. But what's the, what's the longest wait time? So let me, let me take a step back and tell you that we also have bilingual staff to communicate with patients and help uh, patients navigate through our system. So um, it would be an understatement for me to just mention telephonic and video remote um, interpreting services. Um, but what is unique about health and hospitals um, in many respects is that not only do we serve a diverse population, but 
our workforce is as diverse and reflects the patients in which we serve. Um, and many of the staff that work at health and hospitals come from the very communities in which patients are, are coming to us to receive quality care. Um, so that is something that I believe is an asset um, and we leverage um, bilingual staff um, to help also in bridging and connecting people in a timely fashion. So to your point, um, you know, the, the 20 seconds or less connection times are really only for telephonic and video remote conference, but there's a variety of different ways in which we connect with patients to ensure that we are communicating with them in their language. Of course, bilingual staff is important, but by law, qualified interpretation is required. Mm -hmm. So uh, how is, I, I hear you saying people are, are coming to the facilities, of course, you know, people um, in our city, you know, low income, immigrant, the diverse New Yorkers depend on H&H &H for quality care, but how is H&H &H proactively reaching out to LEP communities, for example, to ensure that they're aware of their vaccine eligibility? That's a great question, Councilman Marie Vera. I think, you know, as, a, as an administration in the city of New York, I think when all of us on, on this call, you know, our primary focus is to inform as many New Yorkers about um, how to, you know, take the, the proper, you know, public safety precautions, you know, where to go if eligible to receive a vaccine. Um, um, and that is something that there is a citywide effort, health and hospitals is part of those efforts. Um, and we use multi-platform, multilingual communication, uh, public awareness campaigns to really push out that messaging. I think the other key aspect uh, for us is you know, leveraging community-based organizations, community leaders and faith leaders to really be the trusted messengers in providing information to communities, especially underserved communities, which is from many of the individuals that come seeking care at health and hospitals. Um, and so that's what we've been doing and will continue to do until every until we've, we've combated this virus. Oh, thank you for mentioning trusted messengers and community-based organizations. Can you clarify in concrete terms how community-based organizations, our CBOs, partnering with T2 are supporting the work of vaccine education outreach and administration in the city? So let me um, say thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, we help to provide access to interpretation services, but um, and provide translation support in 15 uh, languages and dialects. Um, and we have almost uh, more than 1,300 bilingual uh, monitors and tracers who speak over 40 languages on the ground for test and trace core. Um, and all sites have interpretation phones and sites have bilingual staff to help navigate individuals and provide language assistance services. So you have community-based organizations that you've partnered with. Can you just explain, can you explain the partnership? Can you tell me what you're providing the community-based organizations? Because these community-based organizations and, and we could just look at, right, Williamsburg, which I mentioned where my uncle lives South Side, and you have El Puente, you have Los Sures, but they're also expected to provide services on, on eviction prevention and social services and you know college readiness and, and taking care of our seniors. And so, I want to make sure that the expectations that we put on them are rightfully supported. So what, what are you concretely doing to empower them and, power, and, and, and support them in this work? Thank you for clarifying it so that I can further explain um, our very close collaboration and partnership with community-based organizations. We have um, approximately 30 community-based organizations in key neighborhoods. Uh, to help support um, messaging out to patients um, about the vaccine um, and about testing um, and also how, you know, the, the measures that they need to take to keep safe um, themselves and their family. Um, and so like Make the Road, Voices Latina um, are some of the organizations, and Inquan are some of the organizations that we closely partner with in um, really communicating at the grassroots level uh, to communities. Um, and that's, that's some, some examples of those CBOs. 
All right, so I'll come back with a couple more questions, but I know that my, um, let me just ask a clarifying question on that uh, because I, I hear what you're saying in terms of the partnership being important, but in, what I would love to hear are maybe like some statistics, some data. You provided $7.8 million of funding for 38 CBOs in July, 2020 for outreach around COVID testing and treatment. Can you confirm that no additional funding or groups have been added since then? Thank you, um, Councilmember Rivera, for that question. CBOs remain a vital part of our outreach um, efforts to educate the public about COVID-19. Um, I don't know if we've, I don't have information uh, readily available to give you an exact number, but the steps that we can take, uh, they provide messaging on the steps that we, that we can take to combat the virus, um, and they provide, you know, education around wearing masks, social distancing, washing hands and staying at home if they're sick. Um, and, and, we, and they serve as a trusted messenger within communities. Um, but I, have, I can always come back with you and provide more information about the exact numbers. That would be great. I, I mean, I don't think these groups can effectively do their job in vaccine outreach with that limited amount of funding. So maybe if you can get someone to get those numbers for us, uh, we would really love that. And so I'm, I'm gonna pass it to uh, one of my colleagues um, who has been a real leader on this issue. And I wanna just thank you for answering my questions thus far. Um, and, and if that's okay with the committee council, I'd love to go to council member Manchaka. Thank you, chair. Um... Yes, we'll turn to Councilmember Rinchaka for questions. And as a reminder, if any other council members have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you in the order in which you've raised your hands. Thank you, Councilmember Rinchaka. And let me just say, we've also been joined by Councilmember Ayala. Hi, and uh, buenos dias to everybody. Uh, thank you, Chair Rivera, for uh, for this for this hearing and this ongoing discussion and ever growing problem with uh, the administration as a whole around language access and I'm really thankful for H and H being here today and answering these questions and this is going to help us uh, with budget conversations that we're having right now and policy recommendations and to support you to support our local uh, CBOs and so I just want to put an emphasis on on this last set of questions that so much is being put on our CBOs on the ground that are already doing so many other things in their mission statement, that taking on this pandemic has been a big burden. Uh, one that they are taking because they know that it will be a life changing um, opportunity for people who are uh, LEP uh, and are looking for information. And so really getting back to us on, on exactly how you are infusing funding and resources so that you're they're not able they're, they're able to do what they need to do so thank you for that i want to step back a little bit and ask a broader question about the efficacy and measuring the efficacy of all the language access tools that you have how do you do that and is it a periodic test of how well each of these pieces are working how do you how do you measure that and when do you measure that thank you council member manchaka I appreciate your support. Um, I know that you are a starch advocate for immigrants and limited English proficient patients within your community and across the city. Um, you know, we have very rigorous quality control measures in place for language services. You know, the one thing that is critical and essential for us from a, a perspective of looking at it from a safety perspective patient safety perspective, looking at it from cultural competency, you know, language service is an essential tool for us um, in order to bridge the communication divide uh, for individuals who are limited English proficient. And, and we strongly believe that no um, patient should be denied or delayed services simply because they have an inability to speak English. So, um, you know, Health and Hospitals is committed to meaningful access to language services. Um, so we continuously monitor language services to ensure the highest standards. Um, and we do this by um, 
having data and analyzing it on a monthly basis, we analyze usage, we analyze our key performance metrics, uh, just to make sure that they're meeting, they're meeting our key performance metrics. Uh, we liaison with the vendors um, on a quarterly basis to do you know, quality assurance reviews. Um, we have also at our disposal a feedback mechanism that is located in all across the facility where if there is uh, an issue with uh, or experience uh, that is you know, not standard uh, to our standards, providers can immediately uh, send a feedback form online. It comes directly to pause. If sure. I can start to pause you in the middle of, of this review, and, and I, I think what I'm hearing is that you do measure. Uh, the question is, can we get access to that information so that we can see uh, the analysis and, and, and for ourselves kind of see how the, the different components are working together? Would that be something you can share with us? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we can definitely share information about our, our data um, so that you can see more closely how how we monitor compliance. Okay, so let's let's walk over to um, another conversation that is happening on the ground right now with indigenous languages. And I know that we're focused on so many of the top languages like Spanish and Mandarin and Arabic and and those that are making it into local law 30, but there are some indigenous languages that are showing up in our communities uh, mm -hmm. like Nahuatl or Mixteco and uh, Quiche. All of these languages are incredibly limited in how we can as a city approach. And in a pandemic, how are you really focusing in neighborhoods that are, are showing up with these indigenous languages so that h, h can help support the mission that you are speaking of today? That's a great question. Um, so we, um, last year alone, health and hospitals provided um, 262 languages and dialects, um, many of which, so 70% of our patient volume is Spanish. Um, and then as you go down, right, um, and then so the top 13 languages that we cover, covers approximately 90% of our patient volume. But to your point, Right, there are emerging languages that um, come that we need to address. So, you know, you mentioned Quiche, Mesteco Bajo, Masteco de Alto. These are all, um, you know, languages uh, that we cover uh, because of the redundancy measures that we have in place. Uh, so, we have multiple vendors. Um, and so, uh, and the, in, in the operations of it, we're ensuring that we're creating coverage through these redundancy measures. And so, that is our process to ensure that every single individual, regardless of language spoken, is connected to services. Okay, well, I think there's a discrepancy. And so we want to get a sense of where that discrepancy is, is hitting. Having access to this technology is one thing, but I think uh, seeing how it lands on the ground is, is another. And so we're, um, I guess, kind of the next question is really some of the limited diffusion languages are more oral than written. Uh, and I think this is something that, that we are really trying to get a grapple on, on health, immigration issues, uh, education issues of the Department of Education. And so some of the written material that is circulated is just not enough. Uh, what video messages have been included uh, in, in your outreach with these um, limited diffusion languages? And what are the plans to include more of that video opportunity so people can hear it and listen to it uh, in our communities? Councilman, time has expired. Can I can I ask a clarifying question? Absolutely. Um, when you're talking about, so I distinguish the translations of documents and the interpretation differently. Are you referring more to the citywide uh, public awareness campaign that's happening through the Vaccine Command Center? Or is it specifically about the services that we provide at health and hospitals? I just want to I just want to make that distinction. Well, I think I'm I'm utilizing experiences that are coming from the vaccine operations, but should be connected to all the hospital relationships that I think are happening both in people coming into the ER uh, or um, or connected to CBO relationships, uh, outreach materials that you're doing. When, when, what I think we're trying to do at the council is trying to figure out how how this holistic approach is actually holistic and that every 
every interaction is a positive reaction and interaction uh, by our community. Okay, thank you for that. I think we're, we are strongly committed uh, and continue to be so in finding opportunities where we can provide languages um, and especially for those um, who um, are languages of lesser, who speak a language of lesser diffusion or less common languages. Um, you know, the, the languages of lesser diffusion pose not a number of challenges for the city of New York. One, they're emerging and so we need to catch up um, but the other aspect of this is that there's a limited pool of interpreters always in these uh, languages and these kind of lesser diffusion languages um, where the market needs to catch up to um, the, the provision of these services. So for us at Health and Hospitals, because we are dealing with medical encounters and, and sensitive health information, um, it's really important for us to ensure the quality of the interpreters that we use. And so there's always um, that kind of gap um, between really making sure that you know, we use medical interpreters that meet the highest qualities, but also keeping in mind the fact that as languages, you know, New York City, that's why New York City is the greatest city in the world is that we have such linguistic diversity in New York, um, and you know that it's an it's a it's an evolving process for us as health and hospitals, and that's why we closely monitoring usage um, and language needs to accommodate for and find solutions. But uh, there are happy to explore um, recommendations that you may want to put forth uh, to see how we can bolster that. But but to note um, for interpret for interpreters and their qualifications um, and to be able to render communication between a provider and a patient, um, there is a requisite level of experience, skills, um, and competencies that's required um, to ensure the integrity of the rendering, but also to ensure the, the patient's safety um, in, in, in making sure they understand you know, what's being communicated and that the provider understands um, and can communicate with the patient. And, and, and to be honest, this is why I'm so thankful for Chair Rivera and this, this hearing. This hearing has, I think, exposed the, the nature of, of something like a market, uh, waiting for a market, and what can the city do to actually bypass this kind of market-driven thing? Because I think that that's been the conversation and if you think about immigration services or um, access to education services and parents engaging with BOE, but now this pandemic is, is threatening our lives. And so I, I want to just go back to this idea that if we can approach this in a different way, what is a better, what is the best way to communicate to a limited diffused language uh, speaker in the city of New York? And what I'm hearing from you is that we have to, we have to uh, wait for the, the kind of highest standard in an, in a, technology access, but isn't someone that works at the hospital that is already trained, that is connected to the system, that speaks that language, uh, the best way to ensure professionalism, quality control, uh, access, immediate. It, it, and, and so if that's the case, and, and you can confirm with that, um, what is the hospital uh, system h and trying to do to either get more resources or have more robust connections with CBOs so that there could be that kind of agreement and, and access? Thank you for that question. Now I'm, I, so I think there's a number of things. Um, one, you know, each method serves its purpose in the overall operations of ensuring that we provide timely and effective delivery of language services. Um, and then I've, as I mentioned in, in, the, in the testimony and will emphasize again, you know, health and hospitals, you know, we have individuals who speak patient languages. Um, and so I, I wanna ensure that, and when we're looking at job postings, especially patient facing job postings where, you know, we have um, individuals that we know that need to connect to service more quickly, we make a, we're very intentional about putting language service languages as a, pre a preference in a job posting um, so that you know we are looking for individuals who are local who are from the community and can speak their language so we are doing all of these things um, 
and will continue to do so simply because it is part of the core of our mission and values um, to ensure that all New Yorkers, regardless of language spoken or ability to pay, get access to quality healthcare services. Okay, I, I, I'm over time now and, and I, want to be, I want to be respectful and I want to say thank you to Chair Rivera. Uh, and on this last point, I just want to say that um, it's, it's not enough. And I think that's what we're trying to just understand what the gap is and where we can work with you to, to bridge that gap of, of connecting more and more folks to jobs at H&H. &H. You know, these are career ladders that uh, people in our communities don't necessarily see. And so how do we change the way of access at a moment right now that has been so critical and people have taken, taken on a burden in the neighborhood to connect to people. Um, and so how do, we, how do we translate that moment of service that sometimes is, most times is volunteer or like, um, the story that Charity Vera gave of her uncle relying on friends and family to do this work. It's, it's a lot of, it's a lot that someone takes. How do we professionalize that and give them say, thank you. Let's bring you on board. Let's bring you into the system. Let's train you uh, in a whole different way rather than a posting on a, on a website. So I, I, I've learned so much this morning. Thank you, Chair Rivera, for being an incredible leader in this, in this conversation. And as the chair of the Immigration Committee, I want to continue to support you uh, and the evolution of this uh, system. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Appreciate that very much. I just, you know, I, I wanna just thank you for Ms. Roman for being here. I, I'm just trying to um, maybe talk a little bit more in numbers and, and data. I think that we've heard from you a philosophy that is very, very agreeable and that I think is very relevant considering that we all celebrate the diversity of New York City. Absolutely. Why we're having this hearing is because we know that language access has been an incredible challenge. It is documented. It's been in the press. We have anecdotal evidence. We have our constituents that reach out to us. We know our community-based organizations don't feel supported. And so what I'd like to hear is, is something that goes a little bit beyond, I think no one waits more than 20 seconds or when I asked have requests for interpretation services increased during the pandemic, you said something to the tune of not really. There has to be more to your answer than that. You know, we, maybe people haven't been coming in the past year for as regular services when it comes to maybe non COVID related care but you certainly had thousands of people coming into your facilities requesting services. So I guess to, to start with the first clarification of the 20, the 20 seconds, and I know you somewhat cleared it up, but I, I still don't understand. I, I don't understand the 20 seconds. And I honestly, I don't believe the, that 20 seconds is the answer to how long people wait for interpretation. So is a 20 second statistic you gave, is it, for only inpatient care? So our services are on demand. Um, so at health and hospitals, the both telephonic and video remote interpreting services is an on-demand services that is provided. We also have bilingual staff that can, can communicate with patients um, at each of our site locations. Um, and so when I'm talking specifically about the 20 second to connect, it really is related to both the kind of technology piece of you know connecting. So if somebody picks up the phone um, and presses the dial, there is an immediate connection to an interpreter uh, that can communicate uh, with the patient. Um, if it's through video remote, we have tablets that we use and you can instantly touch the language spoken and connect with an interpreter through video remote and connect the patient. So when I'm referring to the 22nd, it is related to the technology that we use uh, to connect patients with an interpreter. And is that any language or only common languages? Like the 13 to 15 languages that you mentioned, is that what the 20 seconds is or is 20 seconds for any language that, that, that someone speaks? That is the average uh, time to connect but it's for over 250 languages and dialects for, for telephonic interpretation services. So what's the longest someone waits telephonically potentially for interpretation? So it, it depends, right? I mean, so 
the one thing to note in this um, in this space um, with this work is that this is, these are human services that are being provided. There are actually humans bridging the communication um, that serve as a conduit between a provider and a patient. Um, and in that, you know, operations vary. It could vary based on peak hours. It can base. It could be vary by surge. Um, it could be. Uh, to uh, Council Member Michaka's point, it could vary by, you know, a language of lesser diffusion where there may be an increase um, in connecting with an interpreter. Um, those are variables that we encounter and that we mitigate um, to ensure that we're connecting patients to language services to receive the care that they need. Are there ever issues determining which language a person needs? So we have a number of resources available at our sites. Uh, we have the language uh, ID desktop display that somebody can point to their language. We issue I speak cards to patients. Um, and then when they come in for their visits, they can present that and we can immediately identify the language need. Our contact centers are equipped with language services to connect call center operators with language services to communicate with individuals seeking an appointment. Um, we have individuals in our intake and registration who speak the language um, because they're coming from the communities in which services are being provided. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that we our methods are vary in scope um, simply to ensure that there is language service coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Well, no, and I, I know that I just want to thank you. You said um 262 languages and dialects 70 to 70 percent of the services that you provide i think are in spanish and again i always appreciate real numbers and you said having data and analyzing it on a daily basis is like the crux of what you will do to make improvements so if you have the data and you analyze it on a on a on um on a monthly on a monthly basis we receive so just to clarify we receive data uh, on a monthly basis that is analyzed um, to ensure that they're meeting our performance metrics. Uh, we also I, get- I understand. I understand the performance metrics. It's just, if you have that data, I, I just asked a few questions about, you know, were there interpretation services that increase? And, you know, it, it could have been, no, it's remained steady. It's increased 10%. It actually went down over the past six months. Because if you have the data and you analyze it, I feel like a lot of what we're discussing today is like philosophical and it's, and it's emotionally based. And, you know, I, I appreciate that. I really do, because I don't think you can do this work without being passionate about the, the services that you're providing. But what we're trying to get to are some of the numbers so we can figure out how to best advocate for health in hospitals. And to also make sure that as we hear from some of the community-based organizations in a little bit, that you can hear directly from them what they need from the city to help this mission and to help address all the inequities that we've seen, all of the challenges, and quite frankly, all of the mistakes that have been made when we should know what languages specifically um, should be provided at certain sites because of an understanding of that community. So let me just ask about complaints, since it sounds like you know, you're doing the best that you can and you're very proud of the work, and I appreciate that. How do you handle complaints about cultural insensitivity and how do you handle complaints about poor language access? Thank you, Council Member, um, for that question. So we, at each of our facilities, we have patient guest relation officers, uh, offices and departments that are guided with um, being able to, you know, offer uh, and mitigate and investigate grievances uh, from our patients. Um, we also have feedback forms uh, online so that we can receive in real time information about any issues that may be happening um, in our system at any given time. Um, so with regard to the complaint process, they are embedded into our overall operations and those things are guided by the patient guest relation office. Um, people can also um, reach out to us directly if need be um, in order to connect um, and you know learn about any issues that happen. And when we 
encounter an issue, whether it's coming from um, the city council or comes from um, the mayor's office, we are quick to be responsive and make an, and do any remedial or any re remediation or correction that is ne needed. Um, again, I also want to emphasize again that this is a 24 hour, seven day operation. Um, and um, and we are, are we work um, for the patients um, and ensure that you know we're providing the best care possible um, in their language. What are the feedback forms like? Are they paper? Or are they online? They're online. Um, so and in, in every site, uh, a provider uh, can either provide a commendation about. Uh, you know, the interpretation service experience, or, you know, there was an issue, they can flag it for us. And we can then drill down and investigate and, and make any necessary corrections with our vendors. Well, I also ask because uh, are the feedback forms translated? Well, these are internal. These are internal monitoring mechanisms in place for us. Well, um, the person that fills out the feedback form to either log a complaint or, or perhaps even praise some of the staff in your facilities, how do they fill out the form? You said it was online, no? It's staff and providers. It's an internal, it's an internal document that we use to monitor across the system. So it's an internal operation tool that we use. So let's say my uncle, he goes into Woodhall, he receives superb service. He speaks only Spanish. He cannot even read a feedback form in Braille if it were available. How does he, log those comments into health and hospitals? That's a great question. Um, we have my chart in Spanish um, that uh, is the patient portal, but we also send out uh, patient surveys in individuals preferred language. Um, so for your uncle, um, he would be receiving once he was discharged from Woodhall or had completed his outpatient um, clinical service at Woodhall would receive um, a patient survey in his language um, to rate our services and to flag any issues. So there's a patient survey when I've received that in, via the MyChart app after I've gone to get a COVID test. So I know that I, I um, that they come in kind of right away after you receive the service. How do you track and analyze the complaints, or I should say the feedback from the patient survey? So the my chart is the patient portal where individuals actively access. Um, the patient experience surveys are something that are sent, so they're not necessarily online, but they can. They're because given you know our patient population, there are a variety of ways in which patients get patient experience surveys just to understand the services and be able to provide feedback that helps and informs. Um, the opportunities for us to be able to provide better care to our patients. So how do you track and analyze them? That is, there is a process for us tracking and analyzing those informations and making any necessary adjustments to services to improve care. So with, with those, for example, do you have, um, for how are they accessible for, for, for someone like, like my uncle? Are, are they able to be read aloud by the app? So no, I think that we, we would mail them. Like for your uncle, right? Yeah. There are a variety of ways in which we disseminate that. So it's not just the online form. Like he would get it in the mail. Um, you usually get it at the end. Or is that because you know that he actually isn't online? Well, we know we know a number of things about our patients. They they require various methods of, of how to message out. Right, we we have intimate knowledge about our patient population, um, and you know we you know it depends on the patient, the language, um, and how we distribute. But we do one. There's access um, both online, but you know we also do multiple messaging out and sending out communication um, so that there is a redundancy in place for us to make sure that we're receiving feedback from our patients with respect to the delivery of care. Is there any way to break down these complaints to better tailor training to specific communities? As of 2019, this had not occurred. 
So we are, can you clarify, can you provide um, clarification? Uh, Absolutely. So you have the complaints, you track and analyze them with your internal process. Mm -hmm. How do you break down these complaints to see, for example, the immediate community around Woodhall have certain consistent feedback, comments, recommendations, maybe there are certain things that trend. How do you make sure that you are responsive to those complaints, whether it be language access, uh, accessibility for people with disabilities, you know, wait times, it could be any number of things, but specifically approaching this work with cultural humility. Can you take those complaints? Can you take the data? And can you tailor it to make specific improvements to really, really support the immediate community or the patient population that frequently goes to that facility? Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rivera, for clarifying the question. So I think for us, it's important for us to always have a pulse of what's happening in the community. And there are a number of different ways in which we do that. Um, of course, we're, you know, complaints will come in and we have access to that. But I think the most important aspect of understanding the community needs is through our daily engagement with our patients, um, our community, our trusted community-based organizations, our community leaders that are really the trusted source in the community to communicate. We also have bilingual staff at each of our site locations who you know, we value in as far as making sure that one, we're addressing the language needs of our patients, but two, that the services being rendered are culturally responsive to the needs of specific populations. Um, we have an array of trainings um, in this space uh, foundationally just to ensure um, that we are making, uh, that our frontline staff and our providers provide culturally responsive services to all of our patients. Um, and so, and those, and the thing to note in this work is this work is always evolving. And so I value one, you know, you telling, telling us where there are specific gaps um, or areas of, of needing improvement so that we can get better um, to provide the highest quality care to our patients. Um, so those are the opportunities. I think the other thing is that we have been very intentional about engaging with our community partners in a way that allows for uh, feedback um, on, on things that we can do better. Um, and we value those, those partnerships that we have with our CBOs, with our community leaders, with our, our, count, our council members who are hearing these, this information and then being able to relay it back to us. Um, so if there are any specific concerns or issues that come through your door, I would, um, I, I value that information because it only makes us able to do um, the work better. Um, and, you know, our immigrant populations deserve nothing less than our best. Agreed. So I guess some of the feedback that we've gotten from a number of constituents, individuals is on um, interpretation. So, and I mean specifically with ASL, how many ASL interpreters work within health and hospitals? So I, I can provide, um, not sure I can provide you with an exact number of ASLs, but I could share with you for American Sign Language uh, services, we have both video, in the video remote interpretations have American Sign Language that is used for video conferencing. Uh, we've integrated this into our telehealth platform to ensure um, that we have ASL interpreters available. Um, and we have vendors that do on-site uh, ASL services uh, to accommodate the needs of individuals who we know need American Sign Language. But the other thing to note is that, you know, we go beyond um, American Sign Language and American Sign Language is not universal. Um, there are a lot of variants to sign language that oh, we- Oh, absolutely. No, I know there's, there's Mexican Sign Language, there's all different types of sign language. I'm asking specifically because you said you do rely on um, council members and others to, to give you some feedback. And so some of the feedback that we've gotten is, is on ASL interpreters. I hope you can give me the number of people 
within H and H who can provide that type of interpretation. We've also received uh, some complaints uh, about language access at vaccination sites. Of course, there have been some that have been H and H related, and some that have been, you know, voluntary hospital system. So I will not ask you about anything that is outside of your immediate purview. But also access to bathrooms and access to seating for those who might have some physical limitations or can't stand for a long time. Um, and there have been some very, very long waits. And I just want to acknowledge you've been joined by Council Member uh, Reynoso. So can you speak to, um, I guess, as, as briefly and as factually data driven as possible, how do you go about um, making sure that you are providing the right uh, uh, I guess at the, the minimal language interpretation for some of these communities at certain vaccination sites. And how are you also making sure that there is adequate um, seating available, that bathrooms are available? How do you make sure that you're responding directly to that immediate community? Well, thank you for raising um, these concerns to us. I don't have uh, specific information that I could share with you at this time, but I'm happy to follow up and provide you with specific information related to the concerns that you raised today. And were you able to get the other information that I asked about regarding the 38 CBOs that were funded back in July, 2020? I asked if you can confirm that no additional funding or groups have been added since then. Um, I can follow up on that as well. My understanding is we are partnering with about 30, I'm not sure of the number exactly. 38. Um, 38, um, and their goal is to do, the, they're vital to the outreach um, and the education, the public education that's going out into communities. Um, but we can follow up uh, regarding that. Do you know any of the groups in the, th in the list of 38? I believe that, um, Make the Road is one of them, Voices Latina, Ming Kwan is my understanding. Um, so we have, um, a, um, I, not offhand like the, the numbers, but you know, there are 38 and we can provide you also with the list of the CBOs if that's um, if, with the- that would be, Well, I've asked health and hospitals for this list many times and, and I, I finally did kind of receive a preliminary list. And I mean, I was asking because- Oh, I have. You know. Did you get Alliance for Positive Change, Arab American Family Support Center, um, the Korean Community Services, Make the Road, Single Stop, Voices Latina, South Asian Council for Social Services, um, and I mentioned the Ming Kwan Center. Right, and so that's, that's definitely some of the groups. And I was just, I was wondering because you know, this is a, a hearing on language access and equitable care. And I think that you laid out pretty succinctly that you believe that the community-based organization involvement is going to be absolutely critical to, to continuing to roll out the vaccine, um, vaccine ser vaccination services in an equitable way. So I just wanted to make sure I, you know, that you were kind of prepared. Like these are the groups that are doing the work for health and hospitals. We're not sure if they've been funded additionally since July, 2020. You know, the need for social services has remained steady at the very least, if not increased because of the public health and the economic crisis that we're going through. So I just wanted to, to know whether you were familiar with those groups um, and what they were providing to their communities. And I hope that we can all agree and that we can all talk to our quote unquote friends in the mayor's office about adequately funding them and funding them right away because they can't continue to function this way without financial support. And I hope that you'll support some of the council members and, and, and everyone else who wants to make sure um, that they are getting funded. Um, I guess the, just my last question, because I know there's a couple of people here that would like to testify is, um, the one thing we don't have is information about how the funding was going to services related to vaccine outreach and education. Do you have any information regarding that? Since I know July, 2020, we were kind of in a very different situation. We wanted to make sure people were getting tested, that they understood that there were services available for them to quarantine should they test positive. But since then we have pivoted to this uh, vaccine rollout outreach and education. Do you know how, how that partnership has changed? 
So health and hospitals is one part of a larger um, effort, city effort, that's driven by the Vaccine Command Center and DOHMH. Um, so I could speak about health and hospitals um, and our efforts, but I can't speak specifically with regard to um, what's happening other than to suggest that you know we are really making a concerted effort to reach as many people as possible um, through um, translations of written material, uh, public facing outreach efforts are being made um, that are led, of course, by the Vaccine Command Center um, and press, social media, signage, internal communications are being pushed out um, both for staff as well as for our patients um, and the larger community. Um, and so we will continue to do the outreach um, to ensure that everyone is informed um, how to stay safe and, and where to go to for vaccines. Understood, understood. I just wanna make sure, I think we agree that these groups cannot effectively do provide all of the services that they already provide and are expected to do vaccine outreach and education without properly being supported financially by the city. So we did it for census 2020. We funded the groups to do the work because they knew how to reach our hardest to reach communities. And so I think that we are late to the game on in implementing the same model for the vaccinations. So I hope that you'll help us in advocating for that. And thank you for being here and answering our questions to the best of your ability. And, and thank you for all the work that's done on behalf of health and hospitals. Well, thank you, Councilmember Rivera. This is an important topic. Thank you for allowing me to present um, on helping our LEP New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm gonna quickly ask if there are any other council member questions at this time. Seeing no hands, I'm gonna thank this panel for their testimony. Uh, we've concluded administration testimony and we will now be turning to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. As a reminder, we have ASL and Spanish language interpretation at today's hearing. So I request that all panelists testifying, please speak slowly so that our interpreters are able to provide interpretation. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panelists after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands. I would like to now welcome our first public panel. Our first panelist will be Lloyd Bishop. You may begin your testimony when you are ready. Your time will begin now. Good morning, Chair Rivera and members of the New York City Council. My name is Lloyd Bishop. I'm the Senior Vice President for Community Health Equity at the Greater New York Hospital Association. Um, as you know, our membership includes every hospital in New York City, both voluntary and public. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Hospitals take their responsibilities to provide language access uh, to patients very seriously, including during the pandemic. We and our members believe that healthcare is a human right, and certainly if you can't communicate with your patients, you can't treat them. So how do hospitals provide language access? You heard a lot from uh, Matilda. Let me provide um, some context for the hospital community. Hospitals operize, um, operationalize language access by having protocols in place and by having um, designated language assistance coordinators to implement those protocols across the enterprise. Every hospital has procedures and every hospital has a coordinator to implement them. Hospital systems usually have a system coordinator as well. Um, in fact, you met uh, one of them on the previous uh, panel. 
while hospitals, um, individual hospital plans may vary based on the community um, and the number of languages spoken, um, there are some basic components. You heard about telephonic and video services, having qualified interpreters, um, professional agency interpreters, um, and document translation. Hospital protocols also include conducting an annual, this will get to some of the questions, um, conducting an annual assessment of the languages a hospital must address, conducting interpreter training, and placing language preference information in hospital records. These protocols are consistent with federal and state regulations. Um, hospital coordinators manage all of this, as you could tell, um, and also um, services for the hard of hearing, deaf, visually impaired, and blind. Um, last year was like no other, our hospitals mounted the largest uh, mobilization of healthcare resources in the nation's uh, history. Uh, we mourn every patient that died, but we are also proud of the brave men and women in our institutions who successfully cared for over 143,000 um, hospitalized patients since the pandemic began. The hospital staff of whom we are proud include those language access staff. So. Having a basic plan in place, the one I described, allows a hospital to adjust, flex, and respond during surge times. From last spring, one of the major insights was the um, innovative use of video remote interpreting when visitation was uh, prohibited at the direction of the state. This meant um, quickly working with vendors to unlock devices. Imagine you have um, video remote interpreting devices, standard telehealth devices, uh, maybe- Time uh, has expired. Time has expired. So in closing, I'll say thank you very much and I'm happy to answer your questions and we can talk about at vaccine sites as well. Okay, I don't know if there was if there was like kind of anything he wanted to hit on, like just to wrap up strong. I don't want to take that away from you. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so um, in terms of the learning, um, it was the innovative use of, um, of, of technology, um, especially when you were um, um, had visitation um, that was prohibited and figuring out ways to do that. And you had to do that on the fly. One of the things we did, and I'll just take another few seconds, um, was we proactively reached out to our hospitals um, at the height of the pandemic last spring to ask how they were doing and what they were working on. And that was one of the issues. Um, but I will just close and say that the um, basic structure that is in place um, is uh, very useful and um, usable, no matter what sort of language access situation the hospital might be facing, um, whether it is um, the standard hospital practice dealing something with a surge, um, but also um, if you are um, um, staffing um, or, or managing a vaccination uh, site. Um, I will will say that because of the directive from the state um, to for hospitals to generally focus on uh, their own um, their staff healthcare staff um, and the lack of vaccine not many hospitals um, have uh, community facing sites um, but it is those basic structures um, and I'll say including something I haven't mentioned bilingual staff who are not qualified healthcare interpreters but bilingual staff who can help uh, navigate and help at the front desk and do those kinds of routine communications. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. So during a fall 2019 hospitals hearing regarding cultural competency, uh, Greater New York actually didn't come to testify and they did not provide written testimony. Well, they did provide written testimony. Let me, let me correct that. Greater New York did provide written testimony and it stated in regards to patients who are LEP that hospitals have policies and protocols in place and designated staff to coordinate hospital activities, including process improvement to address any issues that may arise. And it said Greater New York supports these activities by convening hospital coordinators to share best practices and challenges and to collaborate with state and national experts in the field. How often do such convenings occur? Um, we actually meet quarterly. Um, we have um, um, been doing that for some time. Um, it's the uh, language uh, coordinators 
Um, and then we also do individual uh, briefings on particular issues. But um, it's such an important issue that we do meet with them on a quarterly basis. Have you identified any trends over the last few meetings, I guess, during the pandemic, these quarterly meetings that have prompted you to change, improve any of the services that you provide in regards to language access? The, certainly the um, interpreters certainly uh, have part of the reason for the convening is that they can share information among themselves about how what they are seeing and how they are dealing with it. That's one of the uh, values of Greater New York convening um, our members. And I will say that um, after um, uh, those um, initial uh, meetings and telephone calls, um, there was a lot of um, sharing of information about how um, how telehealth in general um, could be used more effectively in terms of um, um, in terms of language uh, access, and how even the VRI, the video remote interpreting tablets, could be used to enhance uh, family communication when the family could not come into the hospital, even if you couldn't connect at that moment to the to the um, general telehealth platform. It helped with family communications. That's something that I think was um, one of the uh, biggest learnings um, from um, the experience that, well, we're still going through. Yeah, was it was it still quarterly during the pandemic? Because I would I would almost say like was that enough? Um, in fact, um, we probably did not meet um, during that that spring. That's why we reached out and spoke to um, not every language coordinator, but as many as we could. The big systems, um, you know, including you know H and H, who who also serves on the body. Do you know how often translation services? are requested on average at New York City hospitals? Do you have that data? Um, I don't have that data on average. No, I don't have that data. Um, but um, certainly the health and hospitals is our largest system in the city. Um, so you can certainly scale down from that. Um, they're all incredibly, remarkably busy. So, uh, but no, I don't have that data by hospital. Considering how large health and hospitals is compared to, I guess, the other systems under your portfolio, do you know how much hospitals spend on translation, interpretation, and other language services? And do you know how maybe how much a health and hospitals versus maybe like a Presby, New York Presbyterian? We haven't done a, a survey on this in a long while. Um, um, if you look at the at the data from uh, language uh, telephonic services, uh, maybe VRI, other things. Um, I mean, a large place can spend um, you know ten million a year roughly, um, and then scale down uh, from that. You mentioned telephonic, and and I know that that's a big component considering you know over two hundred languages are, are spoken. Um, in, in our great city. But do you think that the request for interpretation services increased during the pandemic? And would you say that a lot of them actually do happen in person? And do you know how long on average, maybe the shortest time and the longest time someone would have to wait to get an interpreter in person? So um, I'm, I'm not gonna answer much um, to your satisfaction um, in terms of specific uh, data, but um, it really does um, matter about the, uh, the modality of, of, of what the, what, what's available, uh, what the person might need um, during the surge, the surge of patients uh, at the moment, but there are you know, bilingual uh, staff who are available. Um, one of the innovations is, um, was the use of um, apps. On, um, on, on phones tied to the, um, um, the um, telephonic service that the hospital might be using so that um, individual doctors also had those trans mobile translation apps. Um, so it can depend on the, the amount of the number of patients at the time. Um, 
And but the idea is to at least begin those uh, conversations in the appropriate language um, as soon as possible. That would be, of course, um, separate from the actual medical interpretation that would take place with the qualified interpreter, either in person or um, through a, a telephonic device. Um, device. No, and I appreciate you saying that because I think, you know, as someone who has experienced this, like myself, you know, being expected to be an interpreter without the technical expertise, it's, it's really a disservice, you know. I just remember being there with my grandmother and trying to tr and translate the questions. It isn't, it isn't fair to her, it isn't fair to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, yep, absolutely. And, you know, it's just things that will be missed, that will be misinterpreted. Are language translation services available at every vaccination site run by voluntary hospitals? Um, so again, there aren't many community facing sites at voluntary hospitals, um, but um, um, if a voluntary hospital is running a site or will run a site in the future, um, that basic structure would be used um, to uh, provide those services. Again, having a bilingual staff with, to help with wayfinding and, and maybe registration, but when you get to the actual medical interaction, which would be the, the, the vaccination itself, um, you would have um, a qualified interpreter either in person or um, through some electronic means. Right. Um, I guess my, my question, I just want to ask again about when someone is actually in the hospital and maybe they're waiting a little bit longer to secure an interpreter for whatever reason, maybe it's dialect, maybe the current interpreters are currently with another patient. Um, the longer time that a visit can take because of interpretation challenges, can that impact insurance and costs to a patient the longer they wait for interpretation services? Um, I mean, I'm sure there would be some uh, impact on that, but that's why hospitals rely not just on one, but on a mix of services. Um, and I have to say that um, telephonic services and video remote interpreting uh, gives you the um, ability to meet those uh, language needs more quickly. Um, and, and getting to um, Councilman Menchaca's question, even for those um, perhaps emerging or uh, lesser diffusion uh, languages, um, the telephonic services really are um, very, very helpful in those situations. So is, is that a, is that a no? I mean, I guess I'll say that's, that's a, I guess I'll say that's a, that's a no because a hospital plan would um, need to have in mind uh, what to do so you can um, reduce the wait times. Right, and I just, uh, just to go back to the question, realizing how large like H&H &H is, um, H&H, &H, probably serves the most diverse patient population, correct? Um, they, they certainly have um, um, uh, facilities around the city. Yes, absolutely. Because I know the rest of the larger um, systems, Northwell, I mentioned Presby, I know they're smaller than, than, than health and hospitals, but I'm wondering how do other hospital systems, how do they do outreach to LEP communities? So um, outreach um, and community health education um, is done um, in partnership with uh, staff like the language coordinators who support, but also community affairs, community relations staff, and then with clinical staff, depending on what the program uh, might be. Um, and those community affairs uh, functions um, always include bilingual staff um, who come from the, um, the community. Um, so the, the work there is to discuss those issues with ongoing community partners um, and provide information um, to those our community members in the language in a culturally appropriate way um, using the advice and knowledge that a hospital has um, about its community. How do you let patients know about like their right to complain, 
their right to receive culturally appropriate care, including translated health services acts, health and hospitals. They said there's a like a survey that patients get. Um, and though it might come in multiple languages, it's not the most accessible way to provide feedback. And again, it could be critical. It could be very, very supportive and positive. So um, how do you gather that feedback and, and how often do you take that feedback, analyze it and try to make appropriate accommodations, changes and improvements to serve that adjacent community of that facility? Um, so in terms of notifying, um, I'll put aside the, the routine, you know, sort of community engagement that, that, that would happen. Um, there's a patient bill of rights that uh, walks through uh, patient rights and the expectations of the hospital. And that is uh, provided by the state government. Um, the state does it in the top six languages. That's one of the areas of frustration. Um, so hospitals often have to... Um, 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 translate that into other languages. Um, but in terms of patient satisfaction, um, um, I guess there would be a team of people who would uh, figure out uh, the appropriate way and in the appropriate language and modality to uh, reach out to individual patients and, and to examine the feedback. Part of this work, part of the work of the language assistance coordinator in the hospital is to annually sort of analyze what is happening and to, you know, make some adjustments based on that feedback. Um, but I think it's a, it's a team approach um, and it is um, part of the hospital patient satisfaction uh, process that happens routinely. So, so what's the, the predominant way that you gather this, this feedback or these complaints? Um, so it would be the, the uh, patient satisfaction forms um, that come in. Um, and um, to the extent that there are complaints that are lodged at the moment, it would be those patient um, uh, relations staff that was mentioned earlier um, who also would uh, provide that, that feedback. And all that would be sort of collected and, and discussed and thought about. Do you know how many of the patient satisfaction forms you get like in a year or in a quarter? I do not, but happy to let you know about that. Get back to you on that. Okay. I um, you're an average or a range or something. No, I would, I would just love to know. I mean, I have, I have legislation that would, that would create a specific office to try to gather this feedback. And then, you know, in order to make appropriate changes and accommodations at some of our city facilities, um, but, you know, we can talk about that another time. So in terms of, I just have just a couple more questions. Um, are there any trainings specifically about the importance of language access and how to provide care to those who are LEP within the system? And how are the implicit bias trainings going? Okay, so um, the... And in terms of the, like, when I ask, about training specifically about the importance of language access and how to provide care to those who are LEP. I guess if you could just answer the implicit bias trainings, how that's connected, if at all, and whether there are within those uh, trainings really enough information about cultural competency as it relates to individuals with disabilities. So, um, in terms of um, training for LEP, um, I won't bother to mention the training that the qualified interpreters go through, um, but there is certainly training that hospital staff will go through um, so they are aware of the language services that the hospital offers and they know how to access it. Um, in terms of um, uh, cultural competency and implicit bias training, um, that goes um, on at uh, hospitals um, in, in various ways. Um, um, whether it is um, at, um, at uh, the onboarding process, uh, whether there are uh, grand rounds um, that where um, speakers are brought in and, and, and talk to doctors and nurses about those, those kinds of issues, online training that is offered. Um, we offered, Greater New York offered, um, some online training uh, for our members, and we are in the process of retooling that. And it includes both general cultural competency 
um, and implicit bias. And it's going to be all online and not in person this time. Um, and, and I'm sorry, and part of, and there are various components of that training. I forgot what was the last point. Um, um, cultural competency generally, implicit bias, um, lang certainly language access, um, certainly um, um, disability um, issues, um, and um, frankly, um, LGBT issues uh, as well. It has a number of uh, components. I appreciate that. I did have a question about um, care for LGBTQ community and specifically individuals who are TGN, CE, and BY. Um, but I, I appreciate uh, you mentioning that. You know, I, I, I think uh, I'll start with questions and, and we'll go to council members and see if any of them have questions for you. But I just, I just like to say, you know, we'd love to see more data about the use of language services at hospitals across the board. Also, if, if you are collecting this data at every hospital, we would love to see information on, you know, those patients who are identified as people with disabilities, on race, on ethnicity, on gender. And, and that's really just to connect to the larger discussion of equity within each of our hospital systems. And you know, Northwell is a very, very big system, as so is health and hospitals, but there are still large diverse populations walking into each of these facilities. And we're really just trying to get at how can we create an experience that is culturally humble, that is relevant to the person walking in and that utilizes the community relationships in a respectable way because understanding the nuances and 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 really the culture and the traditions within each of these communities is so so important and i and i understand we've been completely overwhelmed over the past year but we already knew that diversity in new york city was was alive and well and so the more information and data that you can get regarding some of those services, some of that, um, I guess, aggregated information within the hospitals, it would be incredibly, I think, beneficial to everyone so we can advocate appropriately. Um, and with that, I would just say thank you for, for answering my questions. Thank you for being here and waiting. And I don't know if, uh, if a committee council, if there's anyone else I'd like to ask questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to ask if any other council members have questions at this time. Um, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'd like to thank you for your testimony. Um, and like, we're going to be moving on to our next panel. Um, in order, I will be calling on Hallie Yi, followed by Sarah Kim, followed by Lori Wong, followed by Saba Nassim. Hallie Yi, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Your time will begin now. very least, Miss Yi has not been unmuted. I think we might be having some technical difficulties. So we'll circle back to um, Miss Yi. We'll start with Sarah Kim. Can we begin when you are ready? Good time, we'll begin now. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. My name is Sarah Kim, Program Director for the Public Health and Research Center at the Korean Community Services. I really appreciate the Chairperson Rivera and members and staffers for the Community and Health Hospitals for giving me this opportunity to testify before you. First of all, thank you all council members of the, of for tirelessly working to fight against the COVID-19 and make tremendous efforts to bring back New York City stronger. Briefly uh, introducing, KCS was, KCS was the first and largest community organization serving immigrant communities throughout the five boroughs, abiding by mission to be a bridge for Korean immigrants and the wider Asian community to fully integrate into society and overcome any economic, health, and linguistic barriers. We respond to our clients' needs nearly 15,000 cases monthly, both in person and remotely, from seven locations by delivering hot meals to homebound seniors, making daily assurance calls, arranging meals 
services for patients, assisting for food stamp application, helping low-income immigrants to sign up for NIS care, Obamacare, and Medicaid, hosting viral hepatitis B testing and mobile mammogram, hanging, handing out flyers about COVID-19 prevention and testing site information. We run numerous services and programs. As a grantee of the test and trace community engagement, we partner with other five CBOs to provide culturally tailored prevention messages on streets, streets and virtually across Queens from Corona neighborhood down to far away. Our team is greatly proud of this critical work to our community members' health and safety. While we have been involved for the past seven months, we could observe some areas in need of improving language accessibility for APA communities. First, testing sites need to consider in language services if they serve a high presence of Asian populations. Last fall, KCS co-hosted a mobile testing event with hospitals at our community center located in zip code 11361 Queens. In this neighborhood, 35% of the residents are Asian immigrants. But out of 10 testing staff members, no one spoke Asian language as, as expected. Korean and Chinese elderly needed our language assistance to understand what they showed for test registration and how to get their test result. To help people lining up for testing, we set up a table for language services, mask distribution, and ice care promotion, for which many people gave positive feedback to us. Second, in regards to tracing, my coworker's mother contracted a virus while working at a nail salon. She received positive results and later received a call from NYC contact tracer. She hardly spoke English, so she asked her son, my colleague, to communicate. Your time has expired. To communicate, to communicate with the tracer. My colleague, my colleague explained that his mother didn't speak English. Therefore, the tracer connected the Korean interpreter to his mother. According to, according to his mother's reflection, the translation service was not done well because the tracer seemed not fully trained in connecting a translator and communicating in three ways. After the first call, she had to respond to the daily checking calls or text message over the two, week, two weeks. But the, all the messages are written in English. She had to entirely depend on intimate family members' language assistance. This situation couldn't make herself quarantine. After his mother got sick, one week after, his father showed the symptoms and got tested positive. My colleague working as a street outreach worker couldn't come out to work for than four weeks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. We'd like to now welcome Hallie Yi to testify. You may begin when you are ready. The time will begin now. Thank you. Um, my name is Hallie Yi and I'm policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Uh, thank you, Chair Rivera and members of the Committee on Hospitals for giving this, this opportunity to testify. Um, just to start some st statistics, um, AP, Asian Americans in New York have the highest rate of linguistic isolation of any group at 42%. And half of most spoken non-English languages in the city are Asian American. COVID-19 has highlighted the barriers the most marginalized APAs face to language access. The mere availability of languages is not enough without effective outreach and implementation of language access policies. It prevents vital communication about any decisions around the pandemic from reaching our communities. We've been told by numerous community members and organizations that there is so much confusion around language rights that exists at COVID testing and vaccination sites. It took us nearly three months to get a single slide on language rights at testing sites from health and hospitals and are still waiting on those from, for vaccines. I've been lucky enough to get my vaccine and I got to see firsthand just what our community members meant. I saw one sign in English stating the availability of language line and nothing else. I've also been unlucky enough to be hospitalized for COVID and witnessed a woman who spoke Arabic wait nearly two hours in an emergency room for an interpreter, much longer than the New York City emergency room interpreter law requires at under 20 minutes. And that's a top 13 language. I can't imagine what others are going through. 
all forms as well um, at vaccination sites are being told um, by our community members that are all in English. We've sacrificed equity in the name of efficiency and that's not going to be effective in the long run. To fix this, the city needs to ensure that interpreters and easily found materials for all languages spoken, that vaccine and testing site information are uh, translated into commonly used and less visible languages in the community. We need on-site interpreters as much as possible at both testing and vaccination sites. Telephones are commonly used um, for commonly used languages should be available, but the city needs to work with our CBOs more to recruit those who can actually interpret and be trained to do so, especially with our low incident languages. We need to regularly um, release accurate data from New York State and city on race and ethnicity, language spoken and disability. We need to know that the state and city is collecting data on vaccine distribution by zip code, age, race, ethnicity, occupation, language spoken, and other factors. If we don't know who's unvaccinated, we can't achieve equity and target and tailor interventions based on the reasons for disparities. The delay of disseminating and general lack of in-language information about the pandemic, including social distancing guidelines and the most basic of information, has led to a higher risk of exposure to the virus for the most vulnerable in our communities. This egregious gap in language access has led to our communities to rely once again upon the community-based organizations who serve them in the absence of proper resources by the city as CBOs act as interpreters and crowdsource translated materials regarding the most basic of information on the pandemic. Outreach to the most marginalized pockets of the community must be prioritized. Without it, their health and very lives are endangered if they are unable to communicate with their schools and healthcare providers. Our community will continue to suffer every day we allow these flaws in the system to exist. But as always, CACF will continue to be available as a resource and partner to address these concerns and look forward to working with the city to, to continue address these inequities we see day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Lori Wong to testify. You may begin when you are ready. The time will begin now. Hey, good morning. My name is Lori Huang and I am Outreach and Health Coordinator at United Chinese Association Brooklyn. So thank you Chairs, Rivers, and members of committees on health and hospitals for giving us the opportunity to testify today. So just to start with a little background, um, United Chinese Association Brooklyn, uh, of Brooklyn is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2002 to mobilize community resource to improve the quality of life for the Chinese immigrant populations in Bensonhurst and Deck Heights of Brooklyn. Um, we house this one of the largest number of Chinese born residents in the cities where more than 60% have low English literacy levels. And over the past decades, 95% of our clients um, serve health from the immigrant families and over 80% of those are low income residents living um, under the federal poverty level. So as we can see the COVID-19 has has exposed some deeply rooted disparities across the healthcare system, which disproportionately impact the vulnerable communities. And there should be um, an inclusive innovation, community outreach and policy work, and a passion for fighting for an equitable futures. And we know that in some like Asian subgroups, like more than half of the population have limited English proficiencies, which is preventing them from having access to a timely COVID-19 information and care. So the Asian community includes like many individuals who may be afraid to seek testing and care at the hospital, like due to language or cultural barriers. Um, problems in Ensuring language access are new, but unfortunately, there are just one more prob problem like health disparities that has been ignored for far too long and now compounded once again in this pandemic. So, for example, like there are reported situations like they don't always have access to interpreters um, or um, interpreters that don't always speak in their specific languages, and they might also feel a little bit uncomfortable or unwilling to share the sensitive personal information, like racial or ethnic origins, with uh, worries like to, to receive prejudicials or unequal treatment, especially with the new wave of hate and continual racial injustice that we see in the society right now. So this can further lead to uncertainty to seek care and treatments um in certain like healthcare facilities and 
because they're like just struggle to communicate with medical professionals and also with the fear of like um, healthcare costs. And this can also delay some COVID-19 testing and treatments in some Asian communities. So that's why most of the times we would rather like, they would rather visit the local clinics or go to the primary care provider to seek some basic care and feel skeptical and insecure about like going to the hospital at the moment. So in order to fight for language access service and health equity during the pandemic, we should definitely actively reach out to the patients the who time have historically has experienced structural racism and working as a community to help patients to get the care and what they need. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Saba Nassim to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin now. My name is Saba Nassim and I am the Assistant Director of SUPNA NYC. Thank you members of the Committee on Hospitals for giving us the opportunity to testify today. SUPNA is the only CBO in the Bronx that offers linguistically accessible and culturally attuned programming and services to the pan-South Asian community. Our community has grown significantly in the last decade, yet resources and funding remain low. COVID-19 has highlighted the barriers our South Asian immigrant community faces in language access in the city's health and hospital systems. Throughout this entire pandemic, Language and digital access barriers have made it difficult for our communities to understand the virus and health recommendations, government policies around the pandemic, test and trace, and now vaccinations. In fact, this lack of language access and cultural competency has led to a higher risk of exposure, infection, and mortality. As a trusted CBO that has invested in building relationships with the community we serve, our community has turned to us as they continue to bear the brunt of the pandemic. From the very beginning, SUPNA has been creating and disseminating materials around COVID-19 and related policies to the community in ways we know will reach them immediately. And now SUPNA is doing that same work around vaccinations, educating on the vaccine itself, addressing fears and hesitancy, and helping our community understand eligibility and how to make appointments. Already, we see the discrepancy in vaccines administered with low income communities of color being vaccinated at lower rates, despite being the most vulnerable and most impacted. Just the other day, one of our older community members came to get food from our pantry. When she came inside to say hello, we asked if she had made a vaccine appointment as she is eligible. She had been coming to us for years now for various services and trust our staff. She related her fears around the vaccine, so we her assured her it is safe and let her know what to expect. Given her limited English and computer skills, we scheduled her appointment right then and today she is happily vaccinated. Unfortunately, there are so many others like her who have not received trusted information, do not have English proficiency or the digital literacy to book their appointments by themselves online. We ask that the city and state ensure that critical information gets to families in the language they need and understand. We also ask that the city and state invest resources in funding in small, trusted Asian Pacific American CBOs like SUPNA that are on the front line, reaching the most marginalized communities to ensure their health, safety, and livelihood. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and we look forward to working with the city council to ensure that all New Yorkers have access to the services and support they need. Thank you for your testimony. I'm gonna now turn it over to Chair Rivera for questions. Thanks to all of you. Thank you so much for being here um, to testify. And I, I appreciate you sharing some of the stories. I think I was, I, I try to be as clear as possible, you know, how we all know that language access has been a real challenge over the past few months, even pre-COVID. So there were specific examples. Um, um, Ms. Kim, if I can just ask you a question about, you said that there was a site where there was really no adequate interpretation available that maybe someone on your staff had visited. You mentioned this was in the, the borough of Queens. Is that right? 
of our testing site? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, we proactively work with uh, Queensboro to to be a more culturally appropriate site for Asian Americans in in our neighborhood. We kept we kept asking. Uh, we would be able to have a, a host a testing event. So when they came in, we found that um, more than 10 staff members don't speak any Asian uh, languages, but that's why we provide our staff members for language assistance. And I thank you very much for that. Have they, has the city or any of these systems tried to support you maybe financially or compensate some of your your staff time or are you doing this on your operational budget as it as it stands oh no we didn't get we didn't we didn't get receive any compensation for this work but yeah because we are we we care for our community community members that's why we voluntarily support them i know and I, and i and i thank you for that and i know that this is one of those moments in our history when we all have to give everything of ourselves. But I also realize how difficult it is to run a nonprofit organization during a fiscal crisis. So I had to ask. Thank you, uh, thank you very, very much. I just had a, a quick question for Miss um, Yi. Are you are you still with us? Hey, thank you. You you mentioned also in your testimony that you happen to be, I think, at a health and hospitals facility, and unfortunately witnessed the, I think an Arab American woman waiting two hours for interpretation. Is, do you, can you just like speak to that for as long as you think is appropriate? And, and can you tell me which, which site it was, which community, which neighborhood maybe? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I live in Brooklyn. Um, I think it was Kings um, County. Uh, essentially, I, I understand that like we were in like the kind of like waiting section for all the people that had COVID and were waiting to be seen. She in the um, hour and a half that uh, it took me to be seen, she had not been spoken to. Um, she was still waiting for telephonic interpretation and had not been provided with it um, by the time I left, which um, was about two hours. Um, and I uh, noticed also, um, there were a couple of individuals that like even uh, Spanish speaking individuals that had that seemed to have been waiting there for about an hour for interpretation as well. Um, and it just was very alarming because it was an emergency room setting. So it's it seems to be something that should be even more urgent than in other areas of the hospital. No, absolutely. I, I agree with you. Um, and I just want to thank you for sharing that because, you know, I realize we we're all completely, you know, in over our heads in many respects, but I just found some of the answers from health and hospitals on how long typically someone has to wait. Yeah. Just irrelevant and, you know, just not factual. So thank you. Thank you very much for all that you do. Thanks to all of you. I, and I, you know, another comment that was made about crowdsourcing materials and us all depending on each other for interpretation. Um, which is effective and it, and it does result to typically in materials that are, I think, not just correct, but, but culturally appropriate. Um, but I realize that that should not be on you all to, to consistently have to not only interpret, but translate everything. So I hope that, you know, with this hearing, there will be a, a, another further sense of urgency on the services that you provide and that you'll be supported to not only deliver on your daily mission, but to really feel like we are grateful to you for all that you have done over these past few months. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to ask if any other council members have questions at this time. Seeing no hands, I'm gonna thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. In order, I will be calling on Eric Agarijo, followed by Rehan Mahmood, followed by Mon Yaku, followed by Anika Chowdhury. Uh, Eric Agarijo, you may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to Chairs Levine and Riviera and members of the committees on health and hospitals 
for giving us the opportunity to testify today. Uh, just a little about myself. My name is Eric Agarijo. I am the Community Outreach and Communication Coordinator of the Korean American Family Service Center. Uh, KFSC provides social services to immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and ch child abuse. So all of our programs and services are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. And keep in mind, 98% of our clients are immigrants and 100% of our staff members are immigrants themselves or children of immigrant parents. So over 95% of our clients' first language is not English and they come from low income backgrounds. Uh, during New York State, when it was on pause and throughout the COVID-19 public health and economic crisis, KFSC responded to a 300% increase in calls to our 24 hour bilingual hotline. Now these 88% of these phone calls were related to domestic violence and sexual assault and child abuse. Between April and August 2020, we responded to over 1,500 hotline calls in KFSC, served 915 individuals, and provided 19,802 services related to domestic violence and sexual assault. So our frontline essential workers met the increased needs and provided in person crisis intervention counseling, case management, and other supportive services, all in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. And these challenges due to limited English proficiencies exacerbated already existing issues due to family violence at home, poverty, and cultural differences. But particularly the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent closings of schools and businesses highlighted these gaps even further. Many of our survivors and undocumented and ex excluded from accessing unemployment insurance do not know how to navigate the healthcare and hospital systems in the US due to language barriers. So as an organization that provides shelter, our frontline staff have been navigating the vaccine appointments and its processes for our immigrant shelter residents who are unable to do it on their own. However, even for our staff members, it was extremely difficult to navigate and unable to make appointments in a timely manner. Now we do understand that this is a new system for all, but for the immigrant survivors, this is just another hurdle to overcome during this challenging time. And we ask we must make the process accessible and user-friendly for these immigrant survivors and their families. And one way to do this is to make sure that the language access is in place. Once again, thank you for this opportunity to testify for you today. Uh, we look forward to working with all of you to establish an effective system for all of our immigrants and immigrant survivors. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Rehan Mahmoud to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin now. I'm Rehan Mahmoud, Director of Health Services at South Asian Council for Social Services, SACS. Thank you for this opportunity to present our work to the honorable members of the committee. Our major areas of focus are healthcare access and benefits, food security and senior support services. We also provide free English and computer classes. Our culturally competent staff speaks 18 different languages, which include 12 South Asian languages, Hindi, Bengali, Urdu, Punjabi, Nepali, Gujarati, Kannada, Marathi, Malayalam, Telugu, Tibetan, Tamil. And we also speak Cantonese, Mandarin, Malay, Creole, and Spanish. In 2020, we served over 25,000 clients through all our programs. The COVID-19 pandemic has played havoc with the lives of our communities. Food insecurity, hunger, and med medical services have become the most pressing needs. Every week, we serve 5,000 individuals through our programs. SACS has translated and distributed literature on COVID-19 testing and vaccination in various different languages to underserved communities living in many neighborhoods of Queens. Our staff has tabled outside many stores, subway lines, and bus stops, providing vital information in different languages about prevention, and resources available to everyone during this pandemic. Rumors about public charge, especially during this, during the peak of the pandemic, created more fear and more disparities in communities who already who were already going through a lot of emotional and financial stress. It was CBOs like SACS 
who increased their outreach efforts and made sure that the right information in the appropriate language that the clients speak is provided so that they can use all the health benefits available to them without any fear. HNH program NYC Care, which provides access to healthcare to those who are undocumented or underinsured, has become a major success. Thousands of clients through, throughout New York City have benefited from this program. One of the major reasons of our success in spreading out the word is that we provide information to, cl to clients in a culturally and linguistically appropriate way. Using these case studies and creating a collaboration between CBOs and hospital systems, we can further create a better way of making sure that every New Yorker has access to information in their own language where when they, can, they enter a medical facility in this great city. I would just like to share a small story. We had a client who, who hadn't visited a primary care physician for nine years, had, had never seen a doctor, spoke Spanish, information is available out there, but it was never presented to him in a culturally competent way that he could understand the system. The fear was still there that I might get deported. The fear was still there that if I go to a doctor, there might be ice standing outside. So we CBOs, KCS, everyone like on this call, um, or like we all collaborate together, make sure that our communities understand the system and then they also like benefit from the, from the facilities that are available. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Manya Q to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Man Yak Yu, Executive Vice President at the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. We are a public health organization that works to bridge the health equity gap for Latino and Asian populations through health and social services. And here is what we see the language access gaps in our public hospitals looking like. In March of last year, a community member tried to visit H&H &H to get seen because she was experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. She had never learned to read or write in her home country she encountered an English-speaking receptionist and was told she should not be there. She was not offered translation and left. Only when she approached AMPS was she later connected to a physician who diagnosed her with COVID-19 and diabetes, but does not want to return to the hospital due to her experience there. And despite the fact that Sunset Park has been named a priority neighborhood in the city's vaccine for all effort, vaccine uptake remains at only 4%. Many of her immigrant community members struggle to navigate the city's vaccination schedule system with limited English and technological proficiency. At the Sunset Park vaccination site, we have been fortunate to work with H&H &H with vaccine blocks to connect local communities of color to vaccines. We developed our own translated vaccine appointment forms and called those who are technologically disenfranchised in the languages to break down access challenges. But even though they are connected at the point of access, they're strange at the point of care. Mr. Wong is an 80-year-old man who has diabetes, lives alone, and walks with a limp, and only speaks Chinese. And for months, he was unable to get an, a vaccination appointment until he, until he connected with us. But when he reached the site, he waited two hours online and was then told he was not on the list to stand aside a long line of other Chinese and Spanish speakers and to complete paperwork entirely in English. He waited in the cold until he could wait no more for five hours. And when he called us, he said, this is unfair. This is too frightening and I don't want to get the vaccine anymore. These language access issues are the exact reason that there is vaccine hesitancy of communities of color. When I visited the vaccination sites last week, here's what I saw. None of the signage nor registration forms is translated into other languages. There are no staff members on site speaking other languages. Instead, they were told to, until, instead we were told to tell community members to bring their own translators if they can. There's no signage telling community members they have the right to language support. And there's only one language assistance kiosk, assistance kiosk that's not even visible, but hidden indoors. Our non-English speaking seniors were afraid of the possibility of standing in line and not be given accommodations for priority service because they cannot communicate regarding, re regarding their needs and ended up canceling their appointments. And our community members are feeling scared, frustrated, and confused. This process is perpetuating the systematic racism that's inherent in our current healthcare infrastructure. And even though we have helped community members move past the point of access, challenges exist at the point of care. Non-English speaking, uh, non -English speakers are being treated differently and set to the side, while English speakers are shown they have more privilege. It generates hesitancy to get a second dose. It creates distrust that our hospitals and CBOs of the yeah, hospital and CBOs that are working to connect them to the system, and we cannot properly address vaccine questions. 
CBOs like AMPS have been at the forefront of vaccine education. Our community health workers offer interpretation to help community members navigate healthcare and social assistance systems. We have created a task for to conduct listening sessions um, in our community to create vaccination education materials. And every month we're distributing thousands of pieces of literature um, through our canvassing and food distribution efforts. We've translated our own materials, our own form, um, to get people connected to vaccine appointments and fielding 60 hours of calls every week to connect people to their appointments. And, but we are not funded to do this work through h, &H and are asked to subcontract with a few funded organizations by Tess and Trace, which only include two APA serving organizations to my knowledge, um, who do not have an obligation to partner with any other groups. And CBOs need to be funded to do this work because we are needed to do this work in a culturally and linguistic, in linguistically sensitive ways. This is not health equity. This is a perpetuated structural healthcare racism and our city and state needs to do better to center voices of to center voices of color and those who are most marginalized. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it back to Chair Rivera for any questions. Actually, if I could follow up on, on the comment about um, being a subcontracted out. So you just mentioned um, you're one of the very few to your knowledge organizations that really understands the community language and, and, and culturally. Have you received any funding since July 2020? So we were not one of the contracted organizations under Tess and Trace. Um, when the list came out, we were given the list, a uh, given list on the web on the website, and told that we could have an option to subcontract with one of these organizations. There was no obligation for any of those organizations on the list to subcontract with other smaller groups. And you know, there are many other groups like ours that are doing on the ground work um, that might not have the resources to go through the convoluted um, uh, application process that Test and Trace put out. So again, these these groups are now left out of funding opportunities. We have not been able to receive any funding directly from Tess and Trace, and we only have a small subcontract with one of the organizations right now, which funded our work through the end of November. Um, but we've been continuing our work since, you know, since as long as I can remember, um, and we have not been funded at all. No, and I thank you so much. And I, and I could also understand kind of like the awkward pressure that is to subcontract when you, I'm sure, you're all operating uh, with very, very limited resources. And I guess just my last question for you, if you don't mind, you mentioned, I think you went to a vaccination site that really had no bilingual, trilingual staff and really none of the materials were translated either. What, do you mind me asking what vaccination site was that? If, if you remember or what neighborhood? I think she has to be unmuted. That was a vaccination site in Sunset Park at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Okay. I mean, I, I think I, I remember you saying that and I just wanted to just reiterate because I think we understand how ethnically diverse Sunset Park is. So there should be some safe assumptions to be made by the city. And it's unfortunate that they were not. I want to make just, um, if, oh. if I could just add, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, if I could just add, you know, something that we heard about today at the site was that, um, Currently, it seems like there may be interpreters at the site, um, but the only interpreter, uh, but the only Spanish speaking interpreter is a security guard. Um, and it seems like, you know, uh, earlier this week, um, we had a community member that was, that could not communicate with somebody at the front and they could not find them on the list and were escorted out by the same security guard. We don't know whether or not this was the security guard spoke Spanish, but that's the exact type of racism that we're experiencing on the sites. Thank you. Thank you for your kind. Thank you to the panel for trying to help people who are experiencing domestic violence and intimate partner violence and, and for trying to help individuals seek primary care at the very least or even urgent care. Just want to thank this panel very, very much uh, for being here and for your testimony. I'll turn it back to committee council. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to ask if there are any other council member questions at this time. Seeing no hands, I'm going to thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. 
Um, in order, I will be calling on Anthony Feliciano, followed by Andy Ospina. Uh, Anthony Feliciano, you may begin when you are ready. Good afternoon, um, Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System. I'm also part of the People of Color Health Justice Campaign. I wanted to thank uh, Councilwoman Rivera and other council members here for the opportunity again to be here to speak about inequities that we're still seeing in COVID response, but also to thank uh, the Councilwoman Rivera for being with us over the weekend on the exact same issue that we are just, all of us are talking about. I'm not gonna reiterate every single thing. Our partners have done it here and we are, we, we are honored to be working with them on many levels. But I would say this, a, a short story. CPHS and myself, more than 15 years ago, fought issues around language access when there was no executive order, when there's no, when there weren't real regulations around it. And I'll give you an example. We had a woman who had a son that had asthma. She was given a prescription that said for his uh, steroids once a day. They had a janitor in the hospital translate for her the, far, the, the drug and she gave the child 11 pills. Why? Because once a day, when you read it, it's once in Spanish. That was a tragedy more than ever before. And we fought from that a lot of language access laws. I say this right now because it is insurmountable to ask a security guard or anyone who doesn't understand terminology and all to be interpreting to someone at a site. We have PIPA laws, we have federal dollars that are going to do this public dollars and there are language access laws that are not being fully enforced or addressed. There is no reason why we cannot work with community-based organizations to identify people, to volunteer there, to speak, to be trained by the city department of health to do language interpretation and translation. The other thing is in the past, when signage was given in a hospital, when it came to interpretation and translation, so they were hidden behind the bathroom doors. They were hidden everywhere. We need to figure out where are these signage being posted and if they're being posted with multiple languages in one paper, because it's confusing for people. They need to be separated for, like, for Spanish speaking, for Chinese speaking, for Korean and so on. The other thing is that they're not working with CBOs to look even what they're writing and what they're messaging. For example, Arabic, is, is, is so academically written that no one in the community can understand it. And this is what we're hearing from many of our colleagues and act advocates. So we need on-site interpreters. We need on-site mental health therapists that speak the language and look like the people as well, because we know about the emotional toll and they can help out. But we don't need security guards because of HIPAA violations that you can see with this to be interpreted. Now, this is the city's level work. We know that the state is also to be finger pointed on many levels of this issue, very similarly. Um, the large hubs are having the most problems because again, you're sacrificing what Haley said, uh, equity for efficiency. We need smaller hubs that can work community health centers and the community organizations work together who have the language access capacity capabilities to help out. Then finally, on the federal level, we need to think about and have council fight back on the pharmacy. Your time has expired. The pharmacies, are having issues. They're not providing interpretation translation services. They only sometimes have the form only in English. The form says right on the top, if you don't have, you need to put your health insurance card and you need a health insurance card to get vaccinated. If I'm a person of color, a person who's Latino, who's reading this in Spanish, the first thing I think about is what is this? I thought this is free. I may even go away. So even in what we're placing in the language and someone's language is important. The other thing is we have 200,000 indigenous people living in New York state, 50% live in New York city. And we have not addressed any of their, the language issues going on with them, including everything else with indigenous communities. And then finally, I think we need to address the fact of the otherness and safety of people of color coming into these sites. Um, you know, particularly with the Asian hate that's going on, we need to make people feel safe, even standing on the line to get care. Those things, uh, so we need interpreters to even say in their language, you're okay here, you're safe. There needs to be some compassionate way of doing things with these sites. The only way we can do that is with community-based organizations and community health workers, and that we need to rein in those pharmacies 
that are not providing what they need to do. And we cannot have an excuse that, well, they're a separate entity getting funding and moving this along. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Andy Ospina to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon. My name is Andy Ospina. I am the TG and CIQ health advocate at Make the Road New York. I'd like to thank the city council and the committee on hospitals for giving us the opportunity to provide testimony today about access to language services and equitable care in NYC hospitals during COVID-19. Make the Road New York is a nonprofit community-based membership organization with over 24,000 low-income members dedicated to building the power of immigrant and working class communities to achieve dignity and justice through organizing, policy innovation, transformative education, and survival services. We operate in five community centers, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, uh, Long Island, and Westchester. Low-income individuals, immigrants, people of color, and other vulnerable communities are dying of COVID-19 at high rates in New York City. It is essential that government and public agencies be linguistically accessible, providing interpretation and translation services for the over 5 million individuals in New York State who are limited English proficient. New York City has made improvements to language access services over the years. However, our communities are still experiencing barriers to accessing healthcare due to language access issues. Hospitals sometimes still rely on family members to translate or provide inadequate and inconsistent translation services when offered. This can be dangerous and have life-threatening consequences as wrong translation or interpretation can lead to misunderstanding of the current health condition and care plan, or even lead to misunderstanding of the discharge plan, much like Anthony said about the instance with the once and the once being misunderstood. Oftentimes, there are delays in accessing translation services at the hospital, which slows down the admittance process or hinders the care received once hospitalized. Make the Road New York members have shared experiences of being ignored while trying to get attention of hospital staff because there was no one who spoke a language other than English. One of our members felt abandoned on an emergency room bed and had to call her daughter on the phone begging for help. She asked her daughter to call the hospital and request the hospital staff attend to her needs. Some of our members have reported not receiving translation or, interpretation, or interpretation services at all, and instead had hospital staff speak to them loudly and slowly as if this would increase their understanding of the English language. We know the value of our public hospitals for our people and our communities, yet mechanisms must continue to exist to ensure equitable and quality translation and interpretation services are being offered to the most vulnerable New Yorkers with limited English proficiency. So during COVID, we saw how much our communities relied on health and hospitals for ongoing care, especially those individuals without insurance. Make the road, we believe that funding is necessary for health and hospitals as they continue to support the most vulnerable communities. Our communities are plagued by an ever diminishing number of hospital beds. Although there has been an increase in teleservices offered, our communities are unable to access these services because of a lack of trust and a lack of adequate technology to access these newer availabilities. Wait times for accessing care were long prior to COVID and they continue to increase. Many clinics that the community relies on for safe sex options, expired. STD and HIV testing among other services are currently closed to the COVID or have limited appointments available. This is increasing the demand for in-person services, thus inundating our hospital system. Community members are seeking services in an emergency room, which should be addressed with a primary care provider or a specialist in a doctor's office or clinic. This inequitable approach is delaying thousands of low-income people of color from continual access to dire health services to treat conditions like diabetes and high pressure. Understanding the needs for the transgender, gender nonconforming, intersexual, and the queer population is important to ensuring that they can access all the necessary testing and treatment required. Especially prevalent in the TGNCIQ community is a lack of inclusive language, which creates a greater divide and another barrier to equitable access to care. Inclusive language across all healthcare settings and providers needs to be enforced in all public health sectors as a part of the city's approach to equitable care. The continued need for mental health services has been exacerbated by COVID, yet few affordable options exist for folks who have limited English proficiency. 
This is especially true for low-income New Yorkers or immigrants who do not have access to health insurance because of their immigration status. As for our TG and CIQ folks, they experience mental health issues at a rate two to three times higher than non-TG and CIQ individuals. So as a proper city response to equitable care, Make the Road recommends the following, an expansion of centers of excellence or h, &H outpatient clinics as an option for integrating comprehensive care communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic, sustained and expanded funding for programs like NYC Care to connect uninsured individuals to free or low cost health services. CBOs should receive sustained funding to do outreach and education for programs such as NYC Care, as well as for COVID and vaccine outreach and education. Continued funding for a community health worker projects where CHWs are based at CBOs and work in close partnership with h, &H healthcare facilities. CHWs can serve as a bridge between the healthcare system and the community ensuring that community members uh, access the health care services they need and expand TG and CIQ healthcare liaison program. Funding for staff at city hospitals can act as case managers and advocates for TGNC patients to help enforce people's rights within the healthcare system to make the best possible healthcare outcomes. I appreciate the committee's time today and we thank and we at Make the Road, thank you for your work on this crucial topic. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm now going to turn it to Chair Rivera for any questions. I just, you know, I had, uh, you both mentioned, you know, a, a bunch of issues I try to, to cover with Greater New York as well as, as health and hospitals. So the expansion of the, the centers of excellence, do you feel, you know, so I think we all know over the past 20 years or so that there's been a closure of hospitals and communities, not necessarily with people who need the care, but people who are not, who have not been able to pay, right? So, you know, further marginalizing our communities who historically have not had the same access to medical services as our more privileged communities. Do you think the, the, the expanding or I guess including more centers of excellence, what is kind of the vision there? Is it in certain communities that you feel just are underserved medically? I guess this question is for Andy. Yeah, I believe if, if we were to turn and talk in terms of steps, that would definitely be one of the first steps for sure to ensure that those communities are being taken care of where they have been left behind. I agree. I agree. And I, and I appreciate you mentioning, you know, our, our transgender, non-conforming, non-binary community. Um, I think, you know, some of the, the competency, the appropriateness there is certainly a, a work in progress. So any sorts of recommendations that your organization might have that, you know, I'd be happy to advocate and, and, and convey with health and hospitals specifically, I think is we're going to be really, really important. I think it can't, all, you know, these services can't be um, you know, filtered down to just a couple centers citywide when, you know, this is such an incredibly important part of all of our communities, you know. Um, and this, Anthony, I guess for you, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, hospital language coordinators or someone at these sites who's supposed to make sure that there's interpretation. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about what you, what you mentioned for a second there? Yeah. Um... Supposedly every site, at least the large pods that are being defined, working army terminal, the other sites, there's probably someone that's coordinating if there are necessary issues around language, if they need interpretation and translation, including for hard of hearing. I do not know if it's in every site, so that's one issue. I don't know if it was at the site where the coordination is actually falling apart. Those things are critically important to look at. I just want to add something that Andy said. I think the center, of, we have things already in place. The World Trade Center um, Clinic, there's some modeling there that we can think about around the centers of excellence so, and things that they, they didn't do that should be particularly important. And then if you look at Mount Sinai's uh, World Trade Center and Occupational Health, they don't get properly funded from even Mount Sinai. So we have things existing in place that can be built upon. And a sense of excellence should be thought about it with community-based organizations. And I'm going to tell you, uh, Councilwoman, that this idea that the mayor is putting out for a pandemic center is a huge problem for me because it, it, it desegregates it and disconnects from community. And that if we're having these centers of excellence, I don't understand what the model is for a pandemic center. 
housed at the Alexander Center, NYU, who are, who are perpetrators of racism themselves as an institution. And it's, in, it's not even in none of our communities. It is in a much more gentrified and a much more affluent community. So why put a pandemic center there? We'll, we'll have the role of a city department of health when someone like make the road and others now we'll have to go to them too to get funding this is this is fragmenting and this is totally racist in my point of view in terms of investment and in terms of policy well, thank you I, I i really appreciate your comments i think you know the the real point of this hearing was to discuss how we're supposed to be more community minded and so with all the organizations that have testified today already doing the work on the ground and not really feeling supported ever, especially throughout the throughout the pandemic, I would say, I think that's been a, a real problem and a disservice to, to so many uh, of our friends, our family, our constituents, our neighbors. So I want to thank you both for taking the time to to testify. And, and I really, really uh, appreciate your words. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to committee council. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to ask if there are any other council member questions at this time. Seeing no hands, we've concluded. Um, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony. We've now concluded public testimony. Um, uh, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Okay, I'm seeing no hands. So I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Rivera for closing remarks. I wanna thank um, the entire staff uh, for the committee, our Sergeant at Arms, everyone at the council for um, really coordinating and, and helping us out to have this really important hearing today. I think we've, We've heard firsthand from uh, people who are doing the work in our communities, from administration officials. I know what we urgently need is prioritization of, of language access at vaccine sites and in all outreach materials, clear documentation and data on how, on how much vaccine supply is going to our communities of color. And it's clear that we need immediately immediate funding to community-based organizations for vaccine education and outreach, which is a model very similar to what we did for the 2020 census. And I know that we've all been trying our best and, and in many ways feel, feel overwhelmed and still struggling to survive. But I think New York City's healthcare system really fell short for non-English speakers during COVID-19 and we have solutions on how to fix it. So we are the most linguistically diverse city in the world. And I, I truly believe that our hospital services and, and public health outreach should reflect that. So I wanna thank everyone for their testimony and how we can take some of these concrete solutions and implement them immediately. And of course, again, to, to everyone for being here for testifying. I guess with that, we will close out the hearing.